Hi everyone and welcome to the Learning from Limited Label Data session in the Frontiers of Machine Learning event. My name is Ahmed Awadallah, I am from Microsoft Research AI and today I will go, I'm going to be talking to you about how do we try to bring AI experiences to everyone overcoming the challenges with limited label data. As an information worker, you have to deal with a lot of sources of information in order for you to be productive from your documents and your slides to your email and calendar. If you are a developer, you also have your code and your pull requests and bugs. If you are a salesperson, you also have your customer data and leads and so on and so forth. In Microsoft, we have been working very hard on trying to leverage AI in order to help everyone be more productive, whether that be by understanding the content of your email messages to better prioritize them or recommend actions for you to take on them, or by better recommendations that tries to predict what are you trying to accomplish right now and sharing and making available the right information for you at the right time. And we strive to build intelligent experiences quickly and efficiently that allow us to reach more markets, languages, domains, and tasks. However, recent machine learning techniques, specifically deep learning, require large amounts of training data. And if you look at the figure I'm seeing, I'm showing on the screen, you would see the performance of one of the Glue benchmark datasets with a BERT based model as we have more and more training data available to us. And we have seen that curve over and over again, where even with large scale pre-trained language models, we still need a lot of training data for the task at hand in order to achieve the desired performance. So if we, were, if we want to reach languages and markets and domains, what would be the best way around that? Can we just annotate all the data that we need? If we are only interested in 100 tasks and each task require a moderate amount of training data, like in the order of tens of thousands, but we also want to support 100 languages for 100 different organizations, the numbers add up pretty quickly and we find ourselves faced with the need of collecting hundreds of billions of annotated data. This is not only hard and time consuming and expensive, but it's also in many cases not feasible because of the private nature of the data that will not allow us of creating manual annotations for it. So let's think about the different phases we go through as we are developing an AI based experience. At the beginning, we typically have limited amounts of annotated data for the task we are interested in but we might have large amounts of eyes of data and associated metadata. The eyes of data is data that's accessible to us, but we cannot see or annotate, so they are always unlabeled. And the associated metadata could be metadata related to the task, such as user behavior signals and so on. In that phase, techniques like weak supervision, where we can leverage low quality labels based on user behavior or other metadata as sources of supervision for machine learning can be very helpful. Additionally, techniques like semi-supervised learning that can leverage unlabeled data by using structured assumptions about the data itself could also be of significant help. Once we have a version of our experience working in a limited set of languages or domains, we can start thinking about expansion to new low resource languages or domains. And in that phase, cross-lingual transfer learning techniques that try to leverage knowledge available in rich resource languages to help low resource ones are very useful. But also domain adaptation techniques that try to do the same, but for new domains. When our experiences are deployed and, and users are interacting and using them, that provides us with a very valuable source of knowledge, which is user interaction data that comes in the form of implicit and explicit feedback about how humans experience our systems. This data could be leveraged in order to learn from implicit and feedback, uh, implicit and explicit feedback directly to improve the system. 
and also to build learning to correct models that are able to recover from mistakes that our models are doing. Finally, all of these techniques are built on top and leveraging recent advances in pre-trained language models such as BERT, Turing, and GPT. So now let's double click on one of them and talk a little bit more about weak supervision. I'm specifically interested in the case where we can leverage user behavior data that might be readily available to us as a source of weak supervision. This real-world data beyond content could still be very helpful for us as we think about building natural language processing models. Many such applications have a lot of information like user actions, current context, and so on and so forth. If we take Office 365 as an example, we have hundreds of millions of active users creating and interacting with trillions of entities like emails and events. Just like modern web search engines have been very successful at efficiently leveraging user behavior data such as queries, clicks, sessions, and so on and so forth, we think we can leverage user behavior session in order to build better machine learning model operating on user content. So going back to the assumptions I was describing earlier, we assume that we have a limited amount of annotated clean data, but we can use user behavior and interactions to generate a much larger amount of weakly annotated data. And our objective is to leverage both sources in order to train task-specific models. Specifically, we have been finding a lot of success in using a meta-learning framework in order to concurrently leveraging the noisy data and the clean data to improve our models. More specifically, you can, uh, you can imagine a setup where we are co-training two models at the same time. Our main model that's trying to solve the task at hand and another model, a meta model, that's trying to take in the noisy data and correct or reweight it in a way that makes it more useful for the main model. When we co-train these two models concurrently, we are able to significantly improve the way we leverage the noisy data in order to improve our systems. We have applied these techniques to multiple applications. For example, when applied to the task of email intent identification, we can collect a small amount of annotated data in the orders of uh, hundreds or small amounts or, or, or thousands but we can collect a much larger amount of weak labeled data derived from behavior signals, such as reading an email or flagging an email, creating a calendar item, attaching a document, and so on and so forth. When we concurrently leverage the clean and the weak data together, you can see that we can achieve much better performance than using any of them in isolation. The weak data tends to be noisy, and deep learning methods tend to be very good at modeling the data, including the noise. So co-training the models on both clean and weak data at the same time allows us to extract the signal from the noisy data in a way that improves our own our overall performance without being significantly affected by the noise. And you can see that we can achieve pretty good gains in different scenarios, even when we have clean data as small as 1%, of the total data or larger amounts of training of clean data as well. There are some scenarios where you don't have a single source of weak supervision, but you can have multiple sources providing multiple labels for the same instance. We applied that to this data set of fake news detection where weak labels are derived from behavior signals such as sharing, commenting, sentiment, and so on and so forth where we have multiple weak supervision signal for the same instance. And you can see that we can also effectively leverage the multiple sources of supervision and that having multiple sources of supervision can further help. Now, going back to our picture, I also wanted to spend some time talking about another scenario, learning to correct. Machine learning models will always make mistakes, and they will never be perfect. 
if we are able to build collaborative AI systems that enable fast and progressive interaction between the human and the model, allowing them to collaborate in order to improve and solve more complex tasks, then we can work around these limitations. One way to do that would be to allow the human to interact with the model to identify and correct mistakes. We studied this problem in the context of semantic parsing, where we have a scenario where you are trying to ask questions against the structured data, such as data in a database. The semantic parser's job is to take in a natural language query and generate a parse in SQL that it can execute against the database. What we see here is a case where the user asked the question and the system came back with an interpretation of the question, but the system made a mistake in its interpretation. If the user is able to provide open form natural language feedback describing what the mistake is and how it can be fixed, it can significantly help the model narrow down the scope of where it's looking in order to fix the mistake. And we have found out that in this application, actually many of the mistakes can be addressed and corrected by seeking feedback from the human. Many of the mistakes were conditions that were dropped or added by mistakes, or some information that should have been included and has not been included, or mistakes about deciding how to order the results or how to aggregate over it. And, with, and in order to do that, we had to construct a data set that allows us to go beyond the parsing problem where we take in a question and generate a parse, but think about the correction problem where you take a question specifying an intent from the user, an incorrect interpretation generated by a system, a natural language feedback provided by the human trying to correct the mistake, and finally the correct parts that we would like to get at. And we can see that we, even with simple methods, we can correct more than 25% of the mistakes using just one round of the feedback. Our model here leverages existing models in semantic parsing, where we basically try to take the semantic parse that has been generated and try to edit it in order to correct it, leveraging the feedback that we have collected from the human. 25% of mistakes is very valuable given it's only one round of feedback, but also we still have a long way to go because as estimated by a human performance, we can see that we can correct up to 80% of the mistakes leveraging the open form feedback. Going back to this picture, you see that there are different ways that could allow us to alleviate the challenge of labeled data scarcity. And we just briefly talked about two of them and how we are applying them to some of the problems we are interested in at Microsoft, such as productivity applications that help you with task completion or question answering and semantic parsing systems that can help you quickly interact with data, finding the right information. But there are so many other interesting directions that we can pursue. And I'm very excited about the three invited talks that we will have in the session, where we will hear from experts in the field about different directions related to the theme of our session. Dr. Marty Hurst from UC Berkeley will start by describing some of her lab's work on building text summarization system without text summaries, leveraging techniques like reinforcement learning that can learn directly from external reward signals. Dr. Graham Newbick from Carnegie Mellon will then talk about how we can expand our models to the long tail of the next 1,000 languages. Finally, Dr. Alex Ratner from the University of Washington will describe some of the work that he has been doing over the years for building machine learning models with weak supervision and applying it to a diverse set of domains such as medical applications or knowledge-based constructions. We are very excited about this session and we hope that you will enjoy the three invited talks and you will participate in the discussion. Thank you so much.
Well, thank you, Ahmed, for that uh, wonderful talk, and thank you, er everyone, for joining the session. Um, uh, as a reminder, if you aren't paying attention to the chat window, uh, we will actually be available in the chat window to answer questions. Um, I'm Paul Bennon, and a researcher at Microsoft Research and co-hosting the session with Ahmed. Uh, and next, we're going to hear from Marty Hurst. Uh, Marty is a professor in the School of Information in the EECS department at Berkeley. Her primary research interests are in search engines, information visualization, natural language processing, and MOOCs. Um, she's been very active in uh, writing on such uh, topics as search user interfaces, as well as a fellow of the ACM, uh, and has many awards throughout her career. Uh, today, she's going to be talking on this theme of limited um, data about self-supervision and summarization is also going to provide some context about summarization challenges in general. So with that, uh, let's go to Marty's talk. I'm Marty Hurst, and I'm very happy to talk about some research we recently completed that we're calling Summarization Without Summaries. This work was done primarily by PhD student Philippe Lebon from UC Berkeley and with two other collaborators, uh, Andrew Sai from Bloomberg and John Kenny from UC Berkeley. So here's a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about. First, the Umbrella Project uh, is the News Lens Project for which the summarization was one piece. Then we'll talk about automated summarization in general, and then we'll talk about our particular approach to abstractive unsupervised summarization. So the overarching project is called NewsLens, and the goal is a better newsreader. It's also a platform, a jumping off place for natural language processing research, including summarization like I'll talk about today. NewsLens is available online for you to try and currently consists of a chat bot in a mobile app as well as a web-based interface that incorporates events, uh, event-driven stories over time. Uh, and this incorporates the automated summaries that I'm going to talk about today. The NewsLens data set is really quite large. It's been gathered over more than 10 years. It includes more than 40 sources uh, from around the world and over 7 million articles. And we use this data set for part of the research I'll talk about today. So next I'll talk about automated summarization, in particular extractive versus abstractive summarization, and then prior ap approaches to abstractive summarization and what our particular definition of a good summary is. So if you're doing summarization, typically your goal is to take a long document and shorten it in some way, but still retain important information from that document. So consider this following news article that I'm going to read through a bit since this is our running example and say we want to reduce it to 20 to 25 words of length. So the article is about Chilean President Sebastian Panera, who announced on Wednesday that his country, which has been paralyzed by protests over the last two weeks, will no longer host two major international summits. Clashes at demonstrations in the capital of Santiago have left at least 20 people dead and led to the resignation of eight key ministers from Panera's cabinet. The president has now canceled the hosting of the Economic APEC Forum and COP25 Environmental Summit, which are both due to take place later this year. This was in 2019. So if you were going to make a 20 to 25 word summary, what would you want to include in this? If you're doing extractive summarization, you have to pull out text verbatim. So you pull out one or two sentences, and that's pretty much all you can do. So you have to pick between these three sentences, among these three sentences, and decide which one would make the best summary. So it's extractive summarization, you pull out a sentence, and that's your summary. The president has now canceled the hosting of the economic APEC forum. Maybe not the best summary. With abstractive summarization, by contrast, you identify key concepts, key words that you want to include in the summary, and then you create a brand new summary by taking those terms and interweaving them with other glue words that make for a fluid, flowing, uh, comprehensible summary. Chilean president announced his country will not host the APEC forum and the COP25 anymore due to protests in Santiago. So this was actually generated by our system. Not perfect, but I think you might argue it gives more information than the extractive summarization summary and in a smaller, and still in a brief form. Abstractive summarization is quite appealing. You can tailor the length and keep, and 
it, often the length of abstractive summaries are shorter than extractive ones because you don't have to pull out existing sentences verbatim. You can pack in more key content into a short space. And also it can count as derived work, uh, which is helpful for intellectual property issues. But the challenges are it's much harder to automate abstractive summarization and only recently has there been progress in this area. And furthermore, it's quite subject to error and especially summarizing news, we don't want to make false statements about what happened in the news. So what are current approaches to abstractive summarization? Well, the standard approach is to use a seek to seek model where you encode the document and you decode out a summary. And what people do for news abstractive summarization is they use an existing very large data set of abstracts and documents, summaries and documents, and they train uh, using a seek to seek model with teacher forcing. Uh, this reference C et al use a pointer generator network to do this. So the benefits are that the model learns what's in the data. Uh, and so actually they don't have to focus on summarization as a task. It's just a standard kind of approach. But the limitations is that the results tend to be more uh, extractive uh, when you actually see the results rather than abstracted. And you can't actually control for the length. You can't say you want a 25 word summary so much. It's really based, the output you get is based on the input that you trained on. And you need very large collections in order to make this work in the training as they are supervised methods. Another approach uh, recently came out well, in 2017 by Paulus et al, which is to use the Rouge metric, which is a standard evaluation metric uh, for summarization and actually optimize on that evaluation metric. So it's Rouge is easy to compute because it's just n-gram overlap uh, between the summary and the reference uh, document, or between, and also between uh, reference summaries. So how well does your summary overlap with reference summaries. Uh, so the idea was what happens if we directly optimize our summarizer with the Rouge score? So what happened was it got very high Rouge scores, so it was successful on that metric. But unfortunately, since Rouge is only an approximation to what a good summary is, the summaries were poorly rated by people. So here's an example output from that work where the first sentences uh, read kind of well, but they're extractive and the sentence or the text outlined in or highlighted in red uh, is really not fluid and doesn't really make a lot of sense. So these got poor ratings from people. So we propose an alternative. Uh, we extend Paul et al's work by building a better evaluation metric and optimizing for that instead of reach. And so our approach is we define what we think a good summary is and then we Try, train a reinforcement learning algorithm to optimize on those metrics. So what are our metrics? What is our definition of a good summary? We define a good summary as a brief, fluent text that covers the main points of the original document. And we'll be emphasizing these three points uh, in the remainder of this talk. So now I'll talk about how to summarize without summaries, talking about how we get coverage via masking, how we retain fluency, all within a reinforcement learning loop, and we'll present some results. So step one is we need to compute what we call coverage. So summaries must contain keywords in order to be a good summary of a news article. So what we do is identify keywords from the document. So here I've highlighted some important keywords that we want to have appear in a summary. So we use a TF-IDF type measure to select terms. Uh, and notice that all forms of the same word are identified. So if host occurs in the original document, we also want to identify hosting and all occurrences of that term. And we also want to identify entity names. And we, we basically identify about 30% of the document's terms, although this is a, a trained uh, to hyperparameter. And then what we do is we mask out those selected keywords. We create a version of the document with those terms masked out. Then the algorithm must figure out which keywords were in the original document, but it has to extract them from the generated summary. And this is different than how masking is typically used. So we generate a summary 
And then the algorithm has to figure out what the blanks are in the original document from the summary. So this incentivizes the algorithm to put keywords into the summary. So if we have this generated summary, this fills in 10 of the 15 slots that we blanked out, um, highlighted in green. There's more than 10 in, there's not 10 words uh, highlighted in green in the summary, but that's because host covers host and hosting in the masked out keywords. So uh, I'm going to start building up a diagram of the algorithm overall, the architecture of the algorithm. So first of all, our goal is to have a brief fluent text that covers the main points of the original document. So we give as input to the summarizer a length, a target length, which helps us enforce brevity, as well as the original document. And the summarizer just generates a summary. Then we mask the document in the manner I just described and we feed the mass document into this coverage model, into a coverage model. Then the coverage model generates a document that's been filled with its best guesses as to what the blanks should be filled with. And those blanks are assigned a coverage score. So a little more detail about that. So those of you who know about BERT and its mass language model might see some similarities between that and the coverage model that I'm talking about right now. So in the BERT mass language model, it blanks out a random percentage of tokens, usually 15%, and it fills in the blanks using the rest of the unchanged, unchanged tokens from the same document. Whereas what we do is blank out all occurrences of a set of key tokens. It's not random, it's motivated, and it's every occurrence. So with BERT, you might blank out one occurrence of Paris and not another occurrence of Paris, but we blank out all occurrences of Paris. And then uh, we fill in the blanks using both the unchanged tokens from that document and the unmasked summary. And our algorithm does use a BERT model and we fine tune it on our coverage scores. So here's that in a bit more detail where the input is a summary uh, followed by a separator followed by the masked document and the output is the, the fed into a fine tuned BERT whose goal is to identify the fill-ins for the blanks. So you can see here, Chile was the wrong guess for the first mask, President was the right guess for the second mask, and so on. In this case, say the algorithm gets 33% uh, of these right, and it gets a coverage score of 0.33. All right, so that's the what we've got there. This Then the next step is to retain fluency. So as we've talked about coverage, and what does that do? It incentivizes finding keywords or content words. But this can lead to generating just a list of keywords, which isn't very uh, appropriate for reading. So our goal is to balance content and fluency. And our approach is to optimize for both simultaneously. So we add to this model, uh, to this architecture, uh, a fluency model, which generates a fluency score. And finally, this is all incorporated into a training loop, uh, uh, in particular, a reinforcement learning training loop. And we use an, the SC, ST optimization procedure, the self-critical sequence training, which originally was applied to image captioning. And we directly optimize the summer, summary score, which is a combination of the fluency score plus coverage uh, with two parameters that are learned. The fluency model only sees the summary, and we use a language model that's fine-tuned on news, on the large news collection from NewsLens, actually, to obtain a score. And we, you see here we do some normalization to put the fluency model within a certain range. And so the final summary score is a weighted sum of coverage and fluency. And in more detail, how the training works is we actually generate two candidate summaries, S1 and S2. These are generated with two different sampling methods and the details are in the paper. We compute a summary score for each of these. And then the gradients for update are based on the reinforced algorithm based on the difference between these two scores, R1 and R2. And there's uh, some details about how if uh, one is lower than it should have been by, uh, uh, by default, then that causes a change in the expectations. So we're essentially, essentially 
increasing the model likelihood of the summary with the higher reward, which increases the expected reward. Here are, uh, here are example training runs, or one screenshot of example training runs. And what we're seeing here is a trade-off between the fluency score and the coverage, and then the summary score altogether, uh, trained over several days. And what you see is at the very beginning, we can get a pretty high fluency using the language model and very low coverage. There's a big spike in fluency, which then rapidly drops off as the coverage increases. So there's you very much see a trade-off between the two, and the summary score shows the two being balanced against each other and then very, very slowly increasing over time. So now I want to show the effect of varying the target length, what kind of summaries you get depending on the length of summary you, get, you are outputting. So these are summaries generated by the model. Uh, so if the target length is 10, we get Panera canceled the APEX summit at Santiago. If we make the length 24, we get Panera said Chileans have been canceling the hosting of the APEX summit which was scheduled to take place in November. If we give it more space, 45 words, we get Sebastian Panera announced Wednesday that his country will not hold the APEX summit, which was scheduled to take place in Santiago. Panera said that Chileans have been paralyzed by protests over the last two weeks. So much better summary, it has more space. And you see the coverage score increases as the length gets longer, which makes sense. There's more room for content words uh, while retaining fluency. And you can see the dynamic nature of the algorithm is able to generate different, qualitatively different summaries depending on the length. So let's do some results and compare this algorithm to others using the standard measure of Rouge. We first show supervised methods, the top ones, pointer generator, pointer generator plus coverage, and the bottom up algorithm get Rouge 1 and Rouge L scores as shown here. Of the unsupervised methods, of which ours is one, uh, text rank, which is extractive, GP2 zero shot, and summary loop, um, 45 length 45 summaries, uh, we're doing better than the unsupervised methods and actually better than pointer generator as well. And this is with no training data. Also, um, we can combine our algorithm with supervised data and we get even better results. So if you initialize uh, a supervised algorithm with the summary loop model, and then train on only 10% of the data. Uh, we do as well as GPT-2 on 100% of the data for the CNN Daily News data set. Uh, if you give summary loop 100% of the data, we actually do better than the, all of the other approaches. Now, if we want to see how abstractive are the summaries generated, uh, some of these tools, some of these algorithms uh, generate rather extractive summaries. So let's compare them. So we look at the measures of how many errors are made and what sort. Are they inaccurate? These are uh, manually uh, assessed. Are they inaccurate or are they ungrammatical? And then how many abstraction techniques are used? So these include compressing sentences, merging sentences, novel sentences, and entity manipulation. So uh, bottom up has uh, some more errors, but it also uses more techniques, more um, abstraction techniques. And the summary loop has some, a few more errors. It's a trade-off there, but far more abstraction techniques than the other two with a 57% technique application success, success rate. So much higher than the other two and with far more abstraction. Here's an example of an abstraction summary generated where the red shows sentence merging and the blue shows sentence simplification. So sentence merging is taking the words from the left in red and making a new sentence and the, the blue is a shortened sentence. You can see it's doing a lot of abstraction to make a shorter document. So to summarize, uh, we have some next steps. We're actually extending a, and adapting the approach to other text generation tasks, including text simplification and summary style adaptation. And this is actually uh, in collaboration with Microsoft Research and actually Philippe Laban is doing an internship this summer at MSR. We also have the chatbot that I mentioned. This is also a paper in the ACL 2020 demo track. And I encourage you to check out the, the YouTube video. Uh, it uses question answering and generated uh, abstracts within it. So in summary, uh, our contributions are summaries that do not require training examples, are highly abstracted, especially compared to the state of the art, 
have configurable length and incorporate key content from the articles. And a new approach to reinforcement learning using fill in the blank with motivated choices for terms that balances coverage and fluency that makes use of special techniques to fortify against degenerative cases that I did not talk about here, but are in the paper. And there's code available on GitHub if you'd like to try it out. So thank you for your attention. I want to, we want to thank our sponsors of Bloomberg, Amazon, NVIDIA, and now Microsoft Research for our work going forward. And I hope you check out the research in more detail. Thank you so much for the very interesting talk, Marty. A reminder to everyone that Marty is available online as well as all other speakers, so please feel free to submit questions in the live chat. Our next speaker is Graham Newbig. Graham is an associate professor at the Language Technologies Institute in Carnegie Mellon University. His work focuses on natural language processing, specifically multilingual models and models that allow us to build natural language interfaces for humans to communicate with computers in their own language. He publishes regularly in top venues in natural language processing and machine learning, and his work has won several awards, including at EMNLB, ESEL, NACL, and others. Most NLB work focuses on few resource-rich languages, such as English and French. In his talk today, Graham will talk to us about how can we expand that to the long tail of the next 1,000 languages. Hello, my name is Graham Newbig from Carnegie Mellon University, and I'm very happy to present today about lessons from the long tail methods for NLP in the next 1000 languages. So as we certainly know, natural language processing techniques have made great progress in the past several years, especially for languages like English or other high resource languages like Chinese, French, etc. However, there's over 6,000 languages in the world, and for the great majority of these languages, we have very little to none of this great language technology that exists for other languages. So why is this? The reason for this is because the machine learning techniques that have led to great strides on English or Chinese or these other high resource languages rely on large amounts of data for training. And if we look at the amount of data available for most of the languages in the world, we don't have anywhere near the amount that we would need. So this is a graph of all the articles in Wikipedia. And we can see that very quickly, the number of articles drops off with the top 30 languages having many more articles than the remaining ones. And once we get down to 300 languages, we see that all the languages after that have no articles at all. So this is a dire situation, and it's even more dire if we look all over the internet, where more than half of the articles are in English. So why should we worry about these long tail of languages that don't have very much data? So one very important reason is that language is an inexorable part of our culture, and preserving these languages is very important to preserving and legitimizing the culture. And language technology can be a tool for this, and a single signal of importance of the culture. In addition, for humanitarian aid, even rudimentary natural language processing can help us understand things in crisis situations. So for example, in the current coronavirus crisis, we are working on creating translation systems that would allow people to understand uh, related information in the languages that they speak. Finally, I think it's just the right thing to do. People prefer to interact in their own languages, so we should let them. So one very strong tool in our toolbox to help scale to these languages is multilingual training. And what we do here is we basically take many different languages and we feed them into a single natural language processing uh, model. And I'm going to talk about three case studies of work that we've been doing in this specifically tailored towards the languages on the very low end of the resource spectrum. Specifically, universal phone recognition, linguistically motivated models for cross-lingual sharing, and balanced training for multilingual models. In all of the sections, there are a few takeaways. So all of them are based on multilingual training methods. In in addition, to scale down to these languages with very few resources, we need to use intuitions from linguistics or advanced machine learning techniques, and I'll outline these for each of the sections. 
So first, universal phone recognition. So one thing to know about very low resource languages is that speech is paramount. And the reason for this is that most languages in the world are purely spoken. And thus the technology we use will need to go through speech. On the other hand, even for the least resource languages, we are often able to obtain speech. So this is an example of a speech collection effort by Stephen Bird, uh, where he has created a simple app that allows you to go to speakers of languages. One example of this is Augustine, a speaker of Tembe, a language in Brazil, and have them speak stories or uh, other content in their languages into the app. And then you can take this and have another speaker, for example, Emilio, who's a Portuguese speaker, um, go and translate that into uh, another language such as Portuguese. However, while taking this data or collecting this data is possible, this can also result in data graveyards. And these data graveyards are basically speech data that's locked up in speech and is never transcribed. So linguists spend a lot of time transcribing this data, but unfortunately human effort for doing this takes a lot of time and this wastes precious time, leads to poor relations with speakers when a linguist goes in and then can't provide anything to them for a long time. And speed is of the essence in these situations. So phonetic transcription is the first step in building resources for a language. And this is basically where we take in a speech waveform and write down the sounds of the speech. This is an example from English, last time I used the steel button. These sounds can be expressed in a number of ways, one way being phonemes, which are language dependent units of sounds denoted by slashes. But at the same time, we can also write down phones, which are language independent sounds denoted by square brackets. And to give an example of this, one phoneme might correspond to multiple phones. So time, steel, and button in North American English all are written with T's uh, for parts of their phonemes. But actually, these are different sounds, and you can try this yourself to see how they differ. So transcription is usually done in phonemes because this is easier uh, to think about for linguists, but this can also be a problem for cross-lingual transfer as phonemes are language dependent. So to give an example of a universal phone recognition model, we use some techniques to handle the fact that phonemes differ across languages in multilingual ASR training. So one way that we could do this, and it has been used in previous work, is a private phoneme model, where basically we predict the phonemes for each language separately. But the problem with this is that there's too little sharing between the languages. So each language is trained basically independently. Another thing you could do is you could have a shared phoneme model, where basically you predict all of the phonemes at the same time, but unfortunately, this gives, has too much sharing because the shared phonemes are actually are language dependent and differ from language to language. So what we propose instead is to use a little bit of our linguistic knowledge and say, okay, first we would like to re recognize universal phones. And then we have a simple transformation to convert these into language specific phonemes. So we tested this model on 11 high resource languages. And then we also took the trained model and applied it to two new languages that had never been seen in the training data, Inuktitut and Tucson, which are actually uh, very low resource endangered languages. We evaluate the model on phone error rate, so the lower is better. And what we were able to find is on the 11 languages, we were able to do just about as well as any other model. But on the very, very low resource languages, our method in yellow was able to do much better than all of the others. And in addition, if you have some idea about what phones tend to appear in the language, you can further improve these results. So another issue in multilingual models is lexical sharing. And what I mean by this is even in very similar languages, there might be small spelling variations. This is an example of Belarusian and Russian where each of the words are very similar in their spelling with only a few small variants. Unfortunately for computers, even these small variations can cause them to think they're completely different words. In addition, there are script differences. So for example, Turkish and Uyghur are languages from the same language family, 
but Turkish is written in Latin script and Uyghur is written in Arabic script. And also there's morphology or conjugation differences where different languages use different suffixes to indicate grammatical features of the word. So we've come up with a few methods to resolve these issues. One is a method that's kind of a general purpose method for lexical sharing between languages. And it's particularly suited for cross-lingual transfer. So the way it works is we take words, we decompose them into their character engrams. And what this allows us to do is this allows us to kind of find words that have similar spellings and ensure they have similar uh, embeddings in embedding space. And this allows us to handle spelling similarity. We then have a language specific transformation and this allows us to handle consistent variations between languages. So this transform is different across languages. And finally, we have a semantic embedding uh, library where we predict a particular embedding for each word. And this allows us to capture latent concepts. And we do this essentially to model when uh, ling uh, words have very different spellings, but uh, correspond to the same concept. So on machine translation for low resource languages, we found that this was significantly better than other options, such as using character engrams only. And also perhaps more importantly, it significantly improves over subword based encoding methods, such as those used in multilingual BERT, a uh, widely used model here. To take this a step further in how we can incorporate linguistic information into our models, we note that a skilled linguist, uh, for example, David is a linguist at CMU, can create a reasonable morphological analyzer and transliterator for a new language in, new, in short order. So basically what this can do is this can take a script that's not written in uh, the phonemes like I talked about before and convert it into its pronunciation and uh, assign its morphological uh, tags. So we then take these linguistic analyses and represent our word with phoneme engrams, uh, the lemma of the word and its morphological tags. And we were able to find uh, that this gave good results on named entity recognition and machine translation over languages that were in different scripts and with different morphological features. Finally, I'd like to talk about balancing training for multilingual models. So as I mentioned before, we have very large problems of data imbalance when we're training multilingual models. One solution to this data imbalance that has been used before is temperature sampling. And basically what this does is this downsamples the most frequent languages and upsamples the least frequent languages when training our models in terms of uh, data size. And this is also a method that's used very widely in multilingual training, such as multilingual BERT or multilingual neural machine translation models. What we ask in this work is instead, can we learn the data sampling strategy directly in order to maximize our accuracy? To do so, we turn to a method that we are going to be presenting at ICML very soon, which is a differentiable data selection. And this is a met meta-learning method that allows us to learn a weighting of training data to optimize a held out development loss. And what we mean by this is we essentially have a data scorer that tries to predict how frequently we should be sampling data. And this data score is learned to minimize the development loss on the data set that we care about. So the main idea is that the score should upweight data that has a similar gradient to the development data. So we calculate a reward for this data score based on the cosine similarity between the sampled data and the uh, development set that we would like to optimize accuracy on. So how can we apply this to multilingual, to learning multilingual data usage? So the existing approach, as I mentioned before, is temperature-based uh, heuristic sampling. And the way this works is basically, we take the size of the training data for each language, we exponentiate it by a temperature value and use this as our value for the uh, sampling data from each particular language. And how we use differentiable data selection to do this instead is we directly parameterize the data score over the standard data set sampling distribution. So basically, instead of sampling by the data size and a heuristic temperature, we directly learn the sampling probability itself. 
We then optimize the model over a multilingual development set to make sure that the model learns to be good at processing all of the languages in the development set. So we performed experiments on multilingual neural machine translation, and we display here gains over a single language baseline, where we have temperature sampling, the kind of state-of-the-art method here. We also have proportional sampling, where we sample each uh, language according to its overall frequency in the data. And the bars here are basically two different data sets uh, and many-to-one and one-to-many translations. So what we can see is in many-to-one translation where the target is always English, proportional sampling works better. And in one-to-many translation, uh, proportional sampling does not work well. And what we see is basically there's no consistently strong strategy with respect to this. On the other hand, um, multi-DDS, our proposed method, and another method that tries to stabilize training with uh, some tricks do significantly better than uh, these baseline methods. So I've given a very brief overview to some of our work, and I'd like to talk about what we know and what's next. So basically, we are currently building a powerful toolbox for cross-lingual learning. This is a very active research area. And as I mentioned, data is a bottleneck, but in another way, human resources are a bottleneck as well. So this is an example of a paper count at 2018 NLP conferences uh, by the country of the person who was publishing the paper. And what I think is really important to see here is, for example, Africa and South America are not, despite their linguistic diversity, are not well represented on this map. So I'm really excited by efforts such is Masakane NLP, which is an African initiative to try to get people from Africa uh, working on uh, NLP on the languages they're interested, etc. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thanks everyone uh, for staying with us. And uh, as you notice, if you're paying attention to the chat, uh, we're having a few uh, difficulties with posting messages. Um, our speakers are here and we'll get to some of these questions in the Q&A if we can't respond to them there. Uh, hopefully we will also get it, be able to get this fixed during this session. Um, and uh, after Graham's great talk, our next speaker is Alex Ratner. Uh, Alex Ratner did his PhD in the computer science department at Stanford. He's now moved to UW and is an assistant professor there. Uh, he's focused on real world problems applied to many spaces, um, but in particular, uh, very much around taking methods such as weak supervision and making them more formal and scaling them out with systems like Snorkel. Uh, and he's going to talk to us about some of those challenges today. Uh, so with that, let's take it away with Alex's talk. Hey, how's it going? So um, I'm Alex Ratner, and I'm going to be talking today about some uh, kind of practical notes, observations, and some of the techniques that uh, I've been developing uh, through the Snorkel project at UW now and also previously, and I'll be covering work from uh, when I was doing my PhD at Stanford, so hence the pastiche of logos there. Um, all around uh, one approach to handling the the lack of, of labeled data that, that is often such a bottleneck to machine learning progress today via um, programmatic approaches to weak supervision. And I'm gonna have a special emphasis in, in this kind of more casual high level chat uh, and, and preface to the Q&A coming up on notes from the field from, from lots of practical deployments, both at Stanford, UW and, and out uh, beyond that. So I'll start with that. And here I'm gonna uh, uh, go a little bit deeper than, uh, than perhaps usual into the motivation of the problem, because I think there's some interesting practical notes about how practitioners actually are using weak supervision, both via uh, um, systems and techniques like the ones I've worked on, uh, along with a myriad of other ones. So I'll start with the, the, the 40,000 foot level motivation, which is that, uh, and again, I think this will be redundant for this crowd, but it's that machine learning development really has a new bottleneck today. Um, and uh, it really centers around the data that these models learn from the, the so-called uh, training data. And so you have, you know, at, at a high level uh, for a standard, let's say IID classification problem, you have three main ingredients. You have some uh, labeled training data that's uh, labeled according to the annotation schema that you want to uh, train the model to, to uh, output according to. You have some kind of model architecture and obviously algorithms uh, 
to, uh, to train it. And then you have uh, the hardware and the infrastructure that this rests on. And it used to be that the model and the features and the, the structure of the model and model architecture and all the hardware and infra, this was where teams spent their time on and got stuck on when deploying machine learning you know, five, 10 plus years ago. One of the most remarkable things that's happened over the last you know, five years or so uh, even is the increasing availability, accessibility, and, and power of these last two steps. So uh, I often use the phrase commoditization, and I think that's uh, meant as a, a stunning positive for what the field has accomplished, what open source uh, um, offerings have accomplished, and that if I want to get, say, you know, a state-of-the-art solution to what often or what used to be a grand challenge problem in machine learning, like classifying images, I can do this in several lines of, of Python to get the latest and greatest uh, uh, model or uh, wrong example given my Python code on the screen, but you got my point. Uh, and I can, you know, pick your uh, pick my uh, uh, favorite or second favorite cloud provider, whatever it might be, and and uh, um, uh, spin this up and uh, get a a really state of the art solution. But of course, this all relies on having the training data and the training data that's carefully labeled and curated and managed according to the problem objectives. And so I'll give an example from a paper that uh, we actually just uh, published in, the, in patterns based on work with uh, several teams at Stanford Medicine and Stanford Hospital. And this is just one of many examples that highlights not just that training data is, is a, a bottleneck, uh, but it's, that, that it's, it's really a, uh, you know, a, a very strident one that has orders of magnitude uh, difference. So in this example, the goal, uh, one of the several goals of, of the different data sets was to classify uh, chest x-rays for triaging. So chest x-ray comes in, should it be read urgently or can it sit in the queue and be read later by a human uh, radiologist? And uh, given a labeled training data set that had taken, uh, in this case, uh, about eight person months to label, uh, the modeling took a couple days. Um, the VR collaborators, they downloaded some of the state-of-the-art, uh, you know, CNN and other uh, image classifier models. Uh, and the variance amongst those models was under a point in, in the metric we were optimizing for, ROC, AUC, on this binary classification task. Conversely, the, uh, the training data, again, as I just mentioned, took eight person months. And the uh, spread, and according to how uh, you labeled and denoised and managed it, which I'll get into in more de uh, detail coming up, uh, accounted for an order of magnitude greater, you know, variance in the quality. So I think this is just one of many, many examples that highlights uh, how training data is not just a necessary ingredient, it's, it's one of the highest leverage points in determining ML success. And it's extremely difficult to get in the real world. So um, everyone from, you know, uh, uh, journalists and scientists and researchers to the largest organizations in the world are often uh, blocked not by the people or the algorithms or the infrastructure, uh, but the labeled training data. So I guess that's that's all stuff that, uh, you know, if you're in this session, you're probably already uh, well versed in. But I want to go a little bit deeper into some of the practical pain points uh, that, that we've gotten to see out in the wild, working with a, a range of organizations uh, all, in all different, you know, sectors and areas. So first is the issue of data privacy. And I think in machine learning, we're very used to the idea of uh, problems on public data sets uh, that can be uh, labeled through some kind of crowdsourcing operation where you take some data, it's either accessible in the open source already, or you ship it out to some external org and uh, pay to have it labeled. And I should note that even this takes a long time. Uh, so ImageNet, uh, again, hopping to an image rather than an NLP example, but um, ImageNet, uh, one of the foundational data sets that fueled a lot of uh, the you know, modern Cambrian explosion of ML progress took two years, uh, over two years to label. And um, I was just public image data. And there are similar stats for other data sets that uh, other training data sets that get labeled. For many, many organizations uh, in healthcare, in finance, in government, in uh, any tech company that has user data, in telecom, uh, and the list goes on, uh, this is just a non-starter. Uh, you can't ship data out of the organization. And often there's actually internal data access issues. So even you know, one team of data scientists or developers uh, may not have access to the data that um, they wanna train their models on internal to that organization due to privacy constraints for say user data or, or cleared uh, uh, data or et cetera. So again, nothing new that data is often private, 
but I think it's often underestimated how much this is a, a practical blocker to building training data sets and therefore to really leveraging modern machine learning techniques. Subject matter expertise is another huge one that I believe is undervalued. Uh, we're used to data sets that involve um, you know, labeling cats or dogs or stop signs or pedestrians on the image side or you know, labeling sentiment or, or uh, you know, name densities or parts of speech on the uh, NLP side. Uh, most, exp uh, you know, most annotation out in the real world requires some kind of subject matter expertise, a doctor, a bioinformatician, a legal analyst, a government expert, et cetera. And annotation schemas, how you label the data for the model are very org specific. And finally, uh, what I think is the most underestimated factor in how modern machine learning is conducted today is the fact that um, you really need to be able to iterate very rapidly. And that iteration has to include iterating on the training data. And this is just not something you can do with massive hand-labeled training data sets. Um, at a high level, you know, you have input distributions that change in the real world. You have upstream components, preprocessor, everything from how you're tokenizing words in an NLP pipeline to how you're subsampling the data. Uh, all of this changes constantly. And every time something upstream changes, you often need to alter the training data, which again, if it's all hand-labeled, you can't do. And then finally, output goals change all the time. Uh, you know, do you want to label these documents eight ways? Sure, label a whole training set uh, over weeks or months to do that. And then someone downstream of that machine learning model decides they actually need a 15-way a classification. So suddenly you have to throw that training data out and start over again. So again, I'm kind of uh, dwelling here longer than uh, maybe necessary for many of you, but I just think it's, these are uh, often underappreciated pain points that really beg the question, uh, how can we do better than just relying on these massive labeled, hand-labeled training sets? I'll throw in one other higher level motivation, which is kind of an engineer's uh, or more kind of toy theoretical motivation, which is uh, in a sense, uh, if we have subject matter experts that have high level domain expertise, uh, we used to have ways to inject that into uh, data processing systems. With expert systems, they would write a rule. Uh, with uh, feature engineering based machine learning modeling approaching, approaches, they would make a feature. Now, each of these uh, approaches had their drawbacks. You know, rules are brittle and expert systems didn't generalize well enough. Feature-based approaches, um, it's not exactly the most direct way to inject this knowledge either uh, because uh, you know, it, it's, it's statistically tricky, but still there were ways to get subject matter expertise in the system. And the way modern ML works uh, today is great if you have lots of label training data, but it often feels like kind of playing 20 questions uh, you know, when you could just ask for something directly today, uh, when you don't have that massive training data set. In other words, imagine you're a, um, an analyst at a bank and you want to classify contracts and you have a, a legal analyst that just wants to say something dead simple. Like if you see the word employment in the title, classify it as an employment contract, right? Sounds extremely simple, uh, but getting that specific heuristic or that specific, uh, um, uh, you know, domain, bit of domain knowledge into a modern machine learning approach via just this input port of labeling data points individually is near impossible, uh, or at least it would require, this is ridiculously uh, difficult, you know, labeling thousands of, of data points, um, uh, you know, something roughly inversely proportional to the sparsity of the feature space just to communicate, you know, one little common sense bit of information. So, um, so contract classification, spam classification, you know, Again, a lot of the question uh, we asked in the work I'm, I'm about to give a little bit of an overview around weak supervision is why is hand labeling the only interface? Why can't we let a subject matter expert, especially when you need a, a very time constrained and an expensive subject matter expert to provide the information, why can't they just directly inject that information? So that was kind of a, a whirlwind tour of, of these very real world pain points that I think are often underappreciated, uh, but that really make labeled training data a, a a very problematic uh, uh, paradigm, not just a slow or expensive one, but really a non-starter for, for many people who wanna use machine learning. Uh, so the key idea that a lot of my work and, and the work of uh, the teams I've been fortunate to work with has focused around is this idea of, of building and managing training data programmatically. And a lot of this work uh, overlaps with um, what's often called weak supervision, the, ability, the, the, the idea of using something that is faster, cheaper, higher level than label than individually labeled data points, but also noisier and, and messier in other ways to supervise machine learning models. 
So I'll just uh, show an example of this. And this is um, uh, an example uh, of a system called snorkel flow. It's based on uh, some uh, research that we've done over the years out of, out of uh, Stanford. And uh, it's kind of an end-to-end -end platform around the idea of programmatic training data labeling. Um, and so the first idea is directly coming from the motivation before, let users directly express their uh, domain knowledge and uh, express them in functional forms. So for example, um, you know, look for the phrase credit agreement in the title. If you see it, label the contract a certain way, otherwise just abstain. And I'll get back to why that abstention part of the semantics is, is actually very important. Uh, now, actually I should be positive before being negative with the red text. The positive part, which should be apparent, is that providing supervision this way kind of bridges the best of rules-based approaches with modern statistical learning approaches, as I'll get to. Um, it allows you to inject domain knowledge directly in an interpretable and auditable and versionable way, and obviously in a way that can be much faster, like in that radiology example. The problem, of course, is that these labeling functions are what's often called weak supervision. They're, they're noisier, um, especially when you're writing them in these functional forms, they might be correlated uh, or redundant in various ways. You might write two labeling functions from two different developers that uh, are near duplicates of each other and you don't want to double count their votes. They can disagree with each other and have varying levels of noise or accuracy. So a lot of the work that we did over the years um, and are still doing is, is working on ways to uh, via you know, latent variable um, modeling approaches to denoise and integrate the supervision uh, with, with theoretical um, consistency uh, guarantees. Uh, some of the latest work is, you know, the intuition is based on looking at agreements and disagreements um, between the labeling functions and either using matrix completion style approaches or triplet based approaches to um, even when there are tangled correlations between these labeling functions, uh, denoise their outputs. Um, and then one key idea here is uh, the ability to generalize. So um, I'll use an example around contract classification. This is actually an example being used at a major US bank. Um, you might ask very reasonably if you, uh, you know, labeled the data and you train this, this latent variable model to combine the, the, the different labeling functions, you now have something that can be applied to new inference time data and label it. Uh, why, what do you need the model for? And the answer in general, uh, although there are actually some more nuanced ones I'll get into a little bit later, is to generalize beyond these labeling functions. Uh, the, the major downside uh, of rule-based approaches is usually, especially with things like text, that they're very hard to write in a high recall and high precision way. So uh, you may label with your labeling functions, uh, you know, some 20, 30, 40% slice of the data. Uh, the idea is to rely on modern statistical learning approaches to generalize beyond that. So one example was uh, even a, a very intensive effort uh, of writing labeling functions for a very high profile problem, got about 84, 85% uh, accuracy. And uh, the model was able to generalize beyond that and get 97% accuracy. So that extra boost was done just via leveraging a, a model architecture over a lot of data. Uh, no additional inputs of, 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 uh, from the expert users. And then finally, one thing that's actually crucial, I won't have time to go into some of the work that's starting around this, but the high level concept that I'd like to highlight is the ability to iterate. And I think in you know, one of the biggest things that we've tried to accomplish with projects so far, and that I think is one of the uh, most important directions for uh, study and weak supervision moving forward, is this ability to rapidly iterate and to take machine learning development from something that often today looks like this one-off, one and done process uh, that always has to start with a massive upfront investment in hand labeling for weeks or months and turn it into something that looks much more like a, a, a rapid iterative error analysis driven development process, just like how we build um, you know, the rest of software. And uh, this is something that you know, uh, in this snorkel flow approach is accomplished quite you know, simply and practically by uh, you know, looking at error modes in the data and then going back and editing or writing labeling functions and turning this crank very quickly. But I think stepping up a level of abstraction, this idea of being able to iterate with weak supervision uh, is extremely, and with machine learning in general, is extremely important and a really fascinating area of study. Skip over this. I mentioned a couple uh, published case studies with just one quick takeaway for each. So, um, and, and I'll move kind of quickly here, but 
Uh, we did a deployment a little while back at Google with uh, three teams there. We deployed a, a version of some of the open source tech around this, this snorkel idea. Uh, we found that, that this approach could replace tens to hundreds of thousands of hand labels, uh, which had a, a big you know, impact the bottom line across, and, and now there's a bunch of deployments. But I think the thing to, to, to emphasize here was that it actually wasn't about the cost of labeling 100,000 hand labels for these applications, because these were, these were you know, high profile ones that had budget for this. It was about the fact that they changed all the time and that it wasn't 100,000 labels once, it was 100,000 labels every couple of days. And even for an organization like Google, this made ML impractical. Um, another example, Intel, I, I'll skip over the details because we're getting close to time, but uh, they just do a great, uh, we did a collaboration with them, similar uh, type of deployment. They did a great kind of rundown of how even you know, hand-labeled solutions have all these hidden costs of, of validation and updating. Uh, that uh, that just caused major blockers compared to a weak supervision approach. And the final thing I'll, I'll highlight, which recently came out in in patterns, uh, was the radiology example I highlighted. And the one takeaway that I want to just briefly mention, uh, in addition to the the exciting performance of of actually going from you know literal person months to person hours uh, with the same quality, was this idea of cross modal weak supervision, where you can uh, write these labeling functions or express signal over uh, a set of features that may not be available at inference time. And in this way, you can essentially do cross-feature distillation or transfer. So in this case, and I'll just briefly give this example and then wrap up, um, the idea was that we had at training time hundreds of thousands of unlabeled data points, but they had both image and text. They had the x-rays, they had the, the uh, transcribed notes from the attendings, we had the, uh, our subject matter experts write labeling functions over the text part. Uh, but then we trained, uh, we used these, these weekly supervised uh, signals to train a model just over the image part. So that way at inference time when only the image came in, uh, the labeling functions were inapplicable, but the model we trained could be, could be run. So I think this is one other idea of training data and weak supervision, not just as a way of getting around this, this training data labeling bottleneck, but also as a way of, of transferring domain knowledge across modalities, uh, form factors. This was also actually in the Google paper, if you read it, it was about transferring it from slow internal features to uh, uh, high performance public uh, SLA compliant features. So uh, I think training, uh, you know, weak supervision and uh, these approaches are more than just about getting around labeling bottlenecks, but also about this, this interesting kind of transfer. And I'll just kind of briefly wrap up and say there's a bunch of other operators that I think are interesting that we uh, have worked on and are still working on, uh, not just labeling data, but trying to abstract other operations like augmenting or transforming data sets, uh, slicing or structuring or partitioning data sets. And I think in general, there's a very exciting research pathway forward and practical pathway forward to say, not just um, how can we label data better, but how can we abstract and automate the other operations, the very diverse other set of operations around uh, labeling, building, managing, versioning, and just maintaining uh, training database systems uh, in a more you know, programmatic, weaker, higher level, and ultimately more practical ways. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap up and I'm excited for the Q&A. Thank you so much, Graham, Alex, and Marty for the very interesting talk. Uh, so now we will move on to the live Q&A session. Uh, so we uh, we ask everyone to submit their questions on the live chat. Uh, Paul and I will be monitoring the live chat and we'll be reading out the questions uh, to our panel and they will be answering it here. Uh, so uh, we uh, let's start actually with a question uh, to Marty. Paul, do you want to get ahead with that? Uh, yeah, I think right before we jump to that, um, there was a question for Alex just in the chat window that uh, he was trying to type to and having trouble. So uh, let's just handle that first before general discussion question. So there's a question about, uh, is this a move towards rule-based systems when we look at things like snorkel? Um, are there uh, you know problems with that treatment of them in terms of constraints and other principles? So Alex, do you want to quickly address that? Yeah, great question. Uh, can you hear me all okay, by the way? My internet is... A little spotty, but uh, yeah, I got flagged by as, as an something in my response was inappropriate, and I'm trying to now adversarially guess what in the language model was picked up because I think I gave a very staid and nerdy response. But um, great question. I think at a high level, definitely a return to um, 
you know, some of the, the beneficial aspects of rules or expert based systems for input. Right. So the benefit of, you know, uh, just, you know, extend, or I guess, uh, intentionally stating some knowledge as a rule rather than extensionally stating it via, you know, lots of individually labeled data points is that it's more direct. It's interpretable. It's modifiable. It's auditable, which people care about. Um, uh, the the downside traditionally is that it's it's often very brittle. It's hard to cover you know the long tail of of patterns in unstructured data like text. So one view of what we try to do with a snorkel like approach or a programmatically supervision approach is you know let users uh, directly express this knowledge, um, and then try to generalize beyond it using uh, stats learning approaches. So I'd say the attempt in, at a high level is to kind of bridge the two. Uh, to um, second thing I would say about um, I may be a misunderstanding, so correct me if I am, but this idea of um, principles versus constraints, uh, you know, one way that we're working on, and, and uh, that's not that big of a, uh, an extension, is to have the labeling functions that go into Snorkel um, output uh, distributions over labels uh, as the, the generic format. And in this way, you can at least incorporate both what I think you're, you're referring to as principles of, you know, labeling something, which is the default semantics right now, and also express, you know, constraints, um, say by having an, a uniform distribution over everything but one label, for example. Uh, and that would be one simple way to step towards this broader semantics for the the input. So we're we're definitely thinking about that right now. And if you have further ideas, we'd love to chat. Thanks, Alex. Um, and yeah, th let's uh, switch over to a question to start with Marty uh, as a response from. And so. Uh, Marty, when we look at the work on summarization and think about how people consume information, uh, why bother to go through the effort of, of building a chatbot? How do you think about information consumption and, and the role that these technologies play in that more generally? There, it's there being a little go. finicky. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, first, I just wanted to, I saw there's some more questions in the chat about how do we choose the terms to join Masco, uh, since I was not able to type my response. I'll answer a little here. Someone asked if we, um, do some uh, training for that. And uh, actually, we use a measure that doesn't require training. It's a TFIDF measure, term frequency divided by document frequency, uh, roughly. And so that uh, sort of inherently finds the most important terms. It's a standard term and a standard approach in information retrieval. And so that's the approach that we're using uh, for that. It's not all that sophisticated, and, and we could definitely pursue more sophisticated approaches. It, it worked pretty well for our purposes, at least so far. Uh, now to answer Paul's question about the chatbot. Yeah, so we're actually really excited about this approach. We're really interested in having, you know, summaries are great for getting a quick overview of what a uh, news article is about, but we'd actually really like to have people engage more deeply with the news and uh, not just, and go beyond the headlines. And the idea behind the chatbot is to allow people to ask questions about an article uh, with the hopes that that will allow them to engage more deeply. So there's evidence that if people interact with information and ask questions, that they learn more about that information. So that's the fundamental idea behind the uh, chatbot. Okay, so it's more sort of self-directed information consumption and, and learning to ask questions more deeply. Somewhat self-directed, but actually the chatbot proposes its own questions as well. So people uh, in our small study that we've performed, people would actually click on those questions to get ideas of what to ask, and they would in additionally uh, ask their own questions. Yeah, that's great. Great, thank you so much, Marty. Uh, so uh, a question for Graham. Uh, so some of the some of the limitations of working on low resource languages is the lack of benchmark data sets. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how we can um, encourage the research community to work more on low resource languages given that challenge? So that, that's a great question and, and thank you for asking it. Um, I, I think there's a, a number of issues here and it depends on what your definition of low resource language is also. Um, I, I think if you even look beyond English, there is a very large lack of benchmark data sets. So if you look at how much the research community and especially the ML-based natural language processing community focuses on things like um, Squad or Glue or Superglue, these are all data sets that exclusively um, include English. Um, recently, there's been a move 
uh, away from this, both by um, my group in uh, collaboration with Google, we created a benchmark for multilingual learning uh, called the Extreme Dataset, uh, X-T-R-E-M-E. And there's also a, a parallel effort by Microsoft um, called the Exclude Dataset. And both of these, what they tried to do is they tried to kind of expand this benchmarking approach over many different tasks to at least more languages, 40 languages, uh, for example, in, in the Extreme Benchmark. However, um, that's still you know the top languages. Uh, and if you want to go down even further, um, you can't just collate the existing data sets, but you actually have to think very seriously about where you can get data. And for some, uh, for some tasks such as machine translation, there is actually some amount of uh, naturally occurring data. Um, and for example, there's um, the OPUS corpus, O-P-U-S, uh, that collates a huge number of data sets, which makes it very easy for uh, machine uh, translation research. However, um, if you uh, if you go even further to like other tasks that aren't machine translation, where there's not as much naturally occurring data, there's really a paucity of data sets. Um, that being said, I don't think this is because of a lack of um, interest in working on these data sets. I think a lot of people who speak languages are interested in working on them. So I think one way forward is a concerted effort to kind of gather together resources about what you need to do to create data sets in uh, particular languages, disseminating them to people who are interested in working in languages. And as I said, um, at the end of my talk, I think community involvement is very, very important. I think involving people who speak the languages um, to kind of get involved and build data sets is one way uh, forward. So sorry for a long answer to a short question, but uh, I think it's a very important and interesting one. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, thanks. And uh, I'm going to go to a question from uh, Tropic Bensel, which has a question about um, when we think about learning from limited data, what are thoughts about using methods like GPT-3 for pre-training approaches and how it applies to learning from limited data and pros and cons? And I guess before throwing this over to the panel, which I think there might be multiple opinions, I have my own, but I'm going to reserve those. Um, uh, I guess I'd separate out two parts of this question. There's sort of pre-training with large models in general, and then generative models in particular. And so like there are other large models um, uh, like BERT uh, that are not necessarily generative. And so I think we can probably separate those two aspects of just large models in general, pre-training, does that solve everything for limited data and then generative? So I'm going to just open it up in general and see who wants to jump in on this one. No one, if no one, I will well, give I my own say, opinion. Uh, <laughs> okay. I could say one quick thing. This isn't even related to, uh, well, it's motivationally related to my work, but it's just actually a note on another researcher's uh, work and not specific to GPT-3, but just around some of these pre-trained language models. There's a paper um, by, uh, um, uh, some researchers out of Facebook recently showing how uh, you know a pre-trained model compares to just uh, training on a large amount of, of data, and uh, and then that could be weekly or or non or, or strongly supervised data. And so I think it's it's interesting to note that it's um you know there are many cases, especially when we bring some of these limited label data techniques into play, uh, where uh, people actually do have sufficient data to with a basic model like an LSTM you know come within a point or even do better than on their particular task then you know, an approach leveraging a, a massive pre-trained model. And so I think it's it's obviously exciting. Uh, um, all of this progress around new transfer learning techniques is extremely exciting, but, you know, there's no one tool that's right for every job or universally better. And you know, there are many cases where we do have tools that could be better for, especially for custom tasks uh, with weekly supervised or, or other types of data available that can perform better. Uh, so that was just one, one of paper kind of showing the other side of this discussion that I think is interesting. Yeah. Um, and uh, and uh, just my own personal experience with this, I kind of will throw on top of that. So I, I, I agree with Alex's uh, comment that I haven't found one technique that universally is great. Pre-training in general definitely reduces the problem for l labeled data. It does not make it go away in my experience. And it's you often have to be aware of how the pre-training was done, the particular type of data, what you were predicting using, um, you know, techniques of masking or self-supervision actually ends up 
being entangled with your problem in not obvious ways uh, when you apply it to certain cases. And so separating those things out. Um, some of the, the recent work, uh, like I think at iClear, there was a paper fr um, out of Uber AI on the plug and play language models is an interesting way of adding more control on some of uh, these massive models that highlights where are the different kinds of uh, issues that come up. So uh, I, I would also like to add uh, something on top of this, which is um, I think pre-training methods, there was actually also a question in chat, um, but pre-training methods are the development in NLP the past you know, three, four years, or maybe 10 years, if you go back to word devec which is also a pre-training method. Um, but the, um, the advances are amazing. Um, they're great. I don't think they will solve all of your problems, but they'll solve a lot of them, including domain robustness, scaling up with very few uh, examples. I think uh, GPT-3 in particular is interesting because they took a very different approach, which is that you're not taking the model and tuning it, you're taking the model and prompting it to try to do something. And there were also some interesting uh, works on demonstrating how this can be used to, um, for example, uh, predict factual knowledge and, and things like this uh, before the GPT-3 uh, thing. The problem with this approach, uh, it's a great approach, the results are very interesting. The problem with this approach that I see now is that what if your model is demonstrating undesirable behavior? Um, what if your model is, for example, saying uh, very offensive or racist things, like some people have pointed out about GPT-3? How do you fix it? And the um, the answer is more clear for our previous paradigm of you know taking a pre-trained model and fine-tuning it, because then you could fine-tune the parameters of the model to you know heavily penalize it whenever it tried to do something like this. It's much less clear how to do that when you're just prompting the model and asking it to to do things. So I think it, it's very interesting, a very interesting development. Um, but there's some things we need to think about seriously uh, there. Okay. Great, thank you so much, everyone. Um, so there's a related question actually to Graham from uh, Fatima, and the question is, uh, what are your recommendations on including information about the structure of the language uh, when doing multilingual models and also, how does that relate to work not only on human languages, but on more structured languages? Yeah, so that's a great question. I actually uh, very briefly answered that in the chat also, but um, we, we have a little bit of work on this. Um, one way that people have been incorporating structured of language, structures of languages is through tree or graph structures. Um, these uh, are particularly useful for programming languages because the syntax of the language is very clear. And um, we know what it, it looks like precisely, but it's less easy for human languages where the structure is not so uh, not so clear. So, um, so one of the questions that that came up was on expertise for labeling. Uh, so, uh, Alex, when you think about domain experts and how to get them to write weak supervision functions in general, and the, the space of weak supervision functions, um, how do you think about bridging that gap between experts and their domain knowledge and you know, getting them to actually write things that reduce to functions that are, are useful for labeling. Um, do you have insights to share there of particular experts and how to make that work more generally in other domains? Yeah, I, well, I mean, I'll start at a high level uh, and I think it's a fascinating question and we've played around with several different, you know, modalities of, hey, you know, write, write rules or, um, or, or more passive ways of collecting data. Um, give natural language explanations is something that my, my colleague Braden Hancock did a paper on um, a little while back. Um, uh, data augmentation is another way of kind of injecting domain knowledge about, um, you know, uh, invariance into the data that is becoming quite popular now, you know, express which, you know, parts of the data can be perturbed or transformed and should not affect the class boundary. Um, even uh, so, so there's, I think, a whole bunch of rich ways that people can interact. I think one of the common things, maybe this is redundant to express, but is that, you know, the, the paradigm of uh, if you have a subject matter expert, um, uh, the only way they can interact and inject their information is by labeling individual examples. Uh, it seems kind of comically inadequate when you actually move into real world settings where these people are, you know, have, have very minimal time and, uh, you know, uh, and, and uh, asking, you know, asking them to play questions um, instead of just having a direct answer. You know, if you wanted to get a subject matter 
to communicate one high value feature. Uh, you know, think about how difficult even theoretically that is to inject in a modern machine learning model these days. Uh, you know, um, and, and so I think that's just motivation for being, you know, for more creativity here. And uh, with respect to some of the, the approaches we've explored, obviously asking um, uh, folks to write down rules um, that they have uh, is one interface that seems to be fairly intuitive. You know, it's a way that you can have highly technical subject matter experts, whether they're uh, doctors or, um, or you know, uh, technical analysts in a government agency or, or, or you know, legal analysts, et cetera, um, that are not programmers, but do have very technical knowledge, express things flexibly. Often you need to provide some kind of primitives or building blocks they express these heuristics or rules over. So there is sort of a kind of new type of maybe feature, you know, feature engineering, but you're just providing some basic building blocks like bounding boxes and images or features and images that they can then express heuristics over. That seemed to be one promising technique of kind of priming that process. And then also the, the ability to leverage existing knowledge resources, which especially in, in both the open web and in large organizations are very rich sources. You know, people often have, you know, in both medical and government areas, for example, there are there have been massive investments in ontologies. And being able to leverage these ontologies, for example, to provide input signal to modern ML methods uh, seems just like a no-brainer, given how much information and investment has been stored in those. So, uh, yeah, both, both both new ways to accelerate expression of SMEs, um, of their knowledge, as well as just leverage the knowledge that's already been expressed and codified. Um, Thanks, Alex. It sounds like there's some opportunity for HCI researchers then to, to also think about how they design uh, that space of, of bounding box and other kinds of inputs. Uh, Ahmed, last Absolutely. thoughts? Absolutely, to... interactivity, yeah, is a huge, yeah. huge thing that I think we should see more of an ML of turning into more of an iterative development process rather than a, you know, label a huge training set, one and done type thing. That's a, a broad area lots of folks are working on, I think is fascinating. Yeah, great, thank you so much, Alex. So uh, our last question, uh, I have a question for, for Marty. Uh, do you have any thoughts about what would be the most interesting problems in the summarization space or in the building summarization systems or other systems like summarization without having access to large amounts of label data. So I was just wondering if you have any thoughts about what would be the most interesting uh, uh, next steps or spaces that you think we should be thinking about. Uh, thanks for the question. I, I guess um, I think I'm, I'm not very good at most, but I think an interesting problem is really uh, that many people have stated to us, to our team, is finding the different threads within a story. So we actually build stories, new stories from different events and stringing them together. But what are the different threads within that story? So if, if there's a, a story about, say, I don't know, um, a worldwide pandemic, um, that's um, not a monolith, right? So there's a lot of different strands within it. And it's very hard right now to even identify what those are and to classify them and talk about them. They have different angles to them. There's an economic story, there's a political story, there's a health story and many sub-stories within that, and how do you detect those, and then how do you display them in an interface to help people better understand the news and understand the nuances within the news. Yeah, I, I, thank you so much. I think I think that makes a lot of sense. And in many times, we just like think of summarization as producing like a short paragraph summarizing something, and that leaves behind a lot of richness in the, information, the underlying information of what we are trying to summarize. Great. Sure. I think we are. Yeah, yeah, I think I think we are running out of time. So I uh, would like to uh, thank our speakers again. Thank you so much for the very inspiring uh, talks. Uh, I personally learned a lot from them. We would also like to thank uh, all that in decent audience for engaging and asking questions. And sorry for the glitches about censoring out some of the uh, comments. We have to uh, figure out offline why the term TFIDF uh, is, is uh, deemed offensive. Uh, uh, that concludes our session about the Frontiers of Machine Learning event will continue today. Uh, we will have a 26 minutes break now and then we will come back uh, with the last session on the climate impact of machine learning. Uh, so hope you can all join us there again. Uh, thank you again so much for everyone that attended and thank you so much for our speakers. Thanks everyone for joining. Thanks to the speakers. Thanks, thank, everyone. You. thank you.